Good morning and welcome everyone. I am Lou Ann Klepper and I accepted Abraling's invitation to moderate Professor Enoch Abo's talk today. I confess that the last time I had real conversations in English with someone was probably like 14 years ago when I lived for one year in the Netherlands, not in Amsterdam as our lecturer, but in Nijmegen at the Radboud University where Hermann Koch was my mentor. At the time, I was impressed that I could communicate with almost everyone. There were two or three exceptions in English, and I didn't feel obliged to learn Dutch. Today, I work at the Federal University of Hondonia in the north of Brazil, where many indigenous languages are spoken. But since they are all minorities, Brazilians in general have the feeling they live in a monolingual country. This series of lectures is an initiative from Abraling Alvivo, Linguists Online. Abraling is the Brazilian Association of Linguistics, and many other international associations aggregated to this project, like the French Permanent International Committee of Linguists, the Latin American Association of Linguistics and Philology, the Argentinian Society of Linguistic Studies, the Spanish Society of Linguistics, the Linguistic Society of America, the Linguistics Association of Great Britain, the Australian Linguistics Society, and the British Association for Applied Linguistics. On behalf of Adrali, I invite you all who are watching to watch other lectures as well on the series Adrali Al Vigo, since eyes and ears of the whole world are following these series of lectures. And I would also like to invite you to get associated to Abraling in these strange times. Getting involved in linguistic projects is important. Our lecturer today is Professor Enoch Abo, who teaches at the University of Amsterdam, who has published systematically since 2006 about syntax and different interfaces, language change, and learning languages. His speech today is entitled Universal Multilingualism, Contact, Acquisition, and Change. I would like to thank Professor Enoch Abo in advance for sharing with us a different perspective on language. At the end of the lecture, I'm sure he will be open to answer questions the public asked on the chat. So welcome everyone. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Can you hear me all right? Yes. yes. Yeah, okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, please let me first um, thank uh, the Abralin team for giving me the opportunity to participate in this world event. And, you know, I'm really grateful to you uh, as a team for putting together this world event which in these difficult times we're going through actually gives us uh, linguists the opportunity to share our thoughts and get to understand one of the properties that make us human and unique. And what I would like to do in this uh, lecture is convince you that what makes us human and unique is actually our capacity of navigating smoothly between different registers, different dialects, and different languages. And this is a common property of all, all human beings. And what I would like to do is actually convince you that this is what linguistics should be about. Linguistics should be about accounting for this capacity that we all have. And I will be doing this from the perspective of contact, acquisition, and change. So the, the title of the talk, which says universal multilingualism is really grounded in this idea that we are unique because we are multilinguals and we have a multilingual mind. I would like to start this discussion today with this uh, first slide where you can already see that these are uh, signboards and banners which were used by protesters on June the 1st after the brutal murdering of uh, George Floyd, which I think is actually the slow killing of our humanity. And here you can see that the, the signs are in two main languages, in Dutch and in English. 
And you might feel like, well, maybe this is because this is an international protest, or at least the protest has an international audience that people are using English. And in that sense, it is interesting to compare these signboards and banners to signboards and banners which were used for various kind of topics in the early 80s, also in Amsterdam by protesters in Amsterdam. And the topics here range from, let's say, nuclear weapons to car crash accidents causing death of children, uh, including uh, local and, and national uh, topics. And you see that here, um, the banners are mainly in Dutch. So within 30 or 40 years or so, the use of more than one language in public debate has been accepted. And of course, there are socio-historical reasons or political or cultural factors which will determine the languages that are in competition in a specific uh, context. So in this case, it is English versus Dutch, but in Gungwe, in, uh, in Benin, uh, it could be Gungwe or Fongwe and French, or in Hong Kong, for example, it could be Mandarin Chinese, Cantonese and English. And those of you who are interested in this debate can look at the work by Asali Koko Mufwene on these issues. So it's not only the fact that uh, speaking more than one language in public domain is sort of acknowledged and accepted, it's actually promoted. So this uh, special issue of the UNESCO Courier dating from 2008 basically has the title like Languages Matter. And then a, a very important point made by the, you know, the collection of articles in this special issue is that languages coupled with immigration and coupled with bilingualism is an asset. So we're now moving from just accepting bilingualism to saying bilingualism is an asset. And the debate is not just out there in the public domain, but the debate is also going on within our scientific domain, especially in, in neurolinguistics, where uh, we have proponents of, uh, let's say, the idea that bilingualism is actually healthy for our brain. So here you have, you know, uh, a news article um, based on uh, Ellen Bialystok work, which says bilingual brains are more healthy, right? And then you have a couple of news, news um, articles, the bilingual advantage, is bilingual is really advantage, uh, an advantage and the bitter fight over the benefits of bilingual. So the debate is also going on within our own field. And, you know, we are trying to figure out what exactly we want to put under the term advantage. So the interim conclusion here is that, you know, multilingualism um, is no more a threat uh, to, uh, let's say the, the speaker or learner, but it, it's actually an asset, at least in some wealthy countries. And this could come out as a surprise for those of us who went to colonial schools where we were actually forbidden from using our languages in public discourse and we were all forced into speaking the colonial language, like in my case, French. And monolingualism in our perspective here, from what I've just shown, is like, you know, just the normal. If you can afford more than the normal, then you go for the excellence. And then the excellence is seen as the special case, which would be multilingualism in this case. And this is supposed to be good for your health, your performance in economy and in society. Now, so the current rationale here is that within the society, we have multilingualism as being the default and monolingualism, sorry, as being the default and multilingualism as being the exception. And within linguistic theory, this is the kind of setup that we've been operating when, within uh, for the past, I would say 50 years or 60 years or so, where the idea is that linguistic theory must account for the language capacity of the monolingual speaker learner. And of course, we can study multilingual speaker learners as an exception because these can tell us something about, you know, language contact. So issues of language contact, which again, we assume to be special. So the, the problem with this rationale is the following. So we have this idea that, you know, there is some sort of growth from multilingualism, so from monolingualism, sorry, to multilingualism, right? So we start as a monolingual, and we move to a multilingual. And this, I think, this way of looking at things is flawed and ecologically invalid. And 
you don't need to do a lot of maths to, to sort of realize this. You just need to go to the global south. And during the introduction, for example, we were told about uh, minority languages in Brazil, where pupils actually speak a different language from the language that they were exposed to in school. So what I will do here is just take an example from my a home country, which is uh, the Republic of Benin in South uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. So in this small country of about 10 million inhabitants, we have six language families, Atlantic, the Devoid, Gur, Kwa, Mende, and Songhai. And believe me, these are as widely different as you'll get, you know, for example, the kind of difference you'll get, for example, between let's say German and uh, Russian, uh, Russian and Chinese. So they are very different. And of course, you know, these five uh, language families uh, involve or consist of 50 different languages. I'm not using the term dialect here. I'm using the term language because I think for the speakers, what they speak are languages, not dialects. And so we have 50 different languages some of which are closely related, like the one that I speak, Gungwe, which is closely related to the one that my mom speaks, which is Gangbe. And, you know, the two are closely related to another language spoken in the area, which is Fongwe. But in this country, education is all in French. So no uh, so-called national language uh, is taught in school, only French is taught. And around the age of 10 or 12, when key, uh, children enter secondary school, they are exposed to English, which becomes a compulsory uh, uh, subject in secondary school. And they are taught English as a second language. And then at the age of 15 or 16, they're exposed to a new uh, Indo-European language, or let's say Romance or Germanic language in addition to English. And these kids will have to choose between Spanish or German. And these subjects are also compulsory. So basically what we see in Benin is that people do not function in just one language. They have to function in more than one languages to actually survive in this kind of society. And you might feel like, okay, this is Africa, you know, everything coming from there is always exceptional, right? That's, that's our kind of general uh, you know, conception of Africa. But actually, if you look at the map of living languages or living, you know, quote unquote, um, provided by, by the ethnologue, what you see is that there is no single country in the world where all these you know, inhabitants of you know, the country will speak just one language, meaning the standard variety. So monolingual countries in terms of standards are really rare. And so are monolingual individuals. There is no such individual out there who only speaks to the standard and no other registers associated with the standard. So these observations actually indicate that speaker learners are typically multilingual. Even though our educational programs are specifically designed into forcing individuals into monolingualism, something that I really think is a basic violation of our human rights, but we can talk about this later on. And then linguistic theory from this perspective, therefore must account for the default. And the default is that speakers, learners, have a multilingual capacity. They have the capacity to navigate between different registers, different dialects, if you have, you know, you like this kind of distinctions and different languages. And this is what I would like to convince you of. So linguistic theory is about the multilingual speaker learner who knows different registers, dialects, of the same language or different languages and navigates smoothly between these different subsystems, sometimes within the same utterance. The claims of this talk then uh, would be to say that the human language capacity evolved multilingual. Speaker learners entertain varying linguistic features as part of different mental grammars. So here I'm already hitting to a point that I would like to, to make clear during this conversation, which is that we don't have just one grammar. We have a variety of grammars that we call upon in specific communicative settings. So for me, a register is actually a subsystem which can be characterized formally in terms of grammar. And these linguistic features can be closely related in the sense that they operate on 
uh, varieties that are more or less akin to each other, or they could be distant in contexts where they are selected from genetically or typologically different languages. So with these premises, then uh, we will be able to develop a linguistic theory that is ecologically valid because we are not talking about the exceptional case, we are talking about the default case. And we can therefore account for the essential multilingual aspect of the human mind, which I'm calling universal multilingualism. And this represents a speaker's learner's capacity to entertain different linguistic features that cannot be stated as part of a single monolithic holistic grammar. And in, in making this claim or in using this definition, I'm building on work by Thomas Rupert from UMass and also my own work um, in the past few years. So how can we see into the human multilingual mind? Well, in order to do that, I will take you through a sort of, you know, slightly different path than we usually use uh, in linguistic theory, such that I will sort of try to convince you that there is a knowledge that is common to all speakers learners, which is the knowledge of code mixing. Even though within linguistic theory, code mixing is supposed to be something that is typical of multilingual speakers learners. I would like to convince you that it's actually typical of any human being. And this is because every speaker learner knows instinctively how to navigate from one register, which I just said, you know, we can characterize in terms of grammar, one dialect or one language to the other. And accounting for this knowledge, I believe, will shed light on core capacity of the human language capacity. Core aspects, sorry, of the human language capacity. So what is what do we mean by code mixing? Code mixing is, is what I'm illustrating here by the first example, which is an example that I just produced myself. I sort of constructed this example myself, and I'm referring to myself here as polyglot A. And this, this example goes as, as follows. la vie est un combat. Voir, combat est un mouillé à vous baigner. You've got to learn, work, and plan it. So in this example where I'm combining Gungwe in red, French in yellow, voir, that is Gengbe in green, uh, English in brown, and Dutch in pink. I'm combining five different languages, even though those who know me know that my Dutch is relatively limited. But I can still use that in code mixing and I can use it right. And the example says something like, the man told me that life is a struggle, but that struggle is not a matter of physical fight. You've got to learn, work, and plan. Now compare this example with the second example that I'm giving to you here, where we have a similar kind of you know, navigation from one language to the other. And the two languages that are involved here are English and Italian. So in the context of a question like, what was your job in Canada? And then the polyglot start answering in Canada, and then get a stretch of Italian, then a stretch of English and so on and so on. But you can already see that there are some elements which pop up, you know, when they are in English, which are like prepositions and, you know, clauses or uh, whole noun phrases. So despite the fact that this polyglot who is using Italian and English and myself using five different languages, despite the fact that we're using different inputs, right? Because the languages that we are using are different. They have different grammatical properties, uh, different, uh, they're used in different contexts. So despite all of this, uh, we see that the patterns that are produced by these two, uh, let's say polyglots are very similar in the sense that the switches that I'm interested in here occur at the closer boundary. Uh, they can occur at the level of the complementizer, whether we are selecting for a finite complementizer or a non-finite complementizer, typically some sort of prepositions that play this role. And they also occur at the level of prepositions, uh, you know, which will introduce new arguments or adjuncts. But what is remarkable about this is not the fact that we, we see this common knowledge uh, between these two uh, speakers and uh, learners, but what is remarkable is that one of these speakers learners, I presume my, you know, myself, 
uh, still has the capacity to inhibit competing languages. And that's why I'm only talking to you now in English and not in French or in Gungwe. The second speaker, however, lost that capacity after a stroke. So this speaker whose name in the literature, uh, here I'm using a work by Fabro, uh, 99, whose name E.G. was 55 years old, right-handed. He spoke Slovenian as L1, Italian as L2, Frulian as L3, English as L4. But after the stroke, this speaker exhibited Vernick's aphasia in all the languages he spoke with a severe mixing in Italian, Frulian, and English. So what we have here uh, is therefore uh, a speaker who shows what is known in the literature as pathological code mixing, which is a condition in which some patients actually uh, use utterances which involve frequent and uncontrolled switching uh, from one language to the other. And this was a definition presented, uh, suggested by Fabro. And these patients actually mix continuously and unintentionally, and they cannot inhibit the competing languages. And they cannot therefore select specific languages. So unlike myself who can select you know, specific languages and you could say, okay, I'm picking the causal boundary, the prepositions and, uh, uh, and certain, let's say junctions to do my code switching because I have this control. These uh, patients actually don't have that control but still they produce the same patterns as I would produce. And there's been a lot of study in the field showing that even when you consider typologically different languages and you consider these patients, they show code missing patterns that are well, I mean, they fall well within uh, the typology of code missing patterns that are observed in neurotypical populations. And this was an observation and a conclusion already reached by Perekman. So I will, in the next following slides, I will illustrate a number of patterns that these patients show to just to convince you that they are doing basically the same thing as a neurotypical person will do. And I will be using terms from Merskin's 2000 um, typology of code mixing. So the first example is, is what Muskin referred to as alternation, which is the example that we saw previously where you have a sequence in English uh, followed by a sequence in, in Italian, followed by a sequence in English and so on and so on. In this example here where we're dealing with patients mixing English and Malayalam, a Dravidian language, what we see is what Peter Muskin referred to as insertion. So you have a whole section of text in Malayalam, and then you have words which are taken from English and inserted in these uh, kind of utterances. And these words are sort of underlined here. In this example, which is very interesting, we have what Peter Moiskin refers to as relaxification. And relaxification is a kind of cognitive process whereby speakers will use the grammar of another language, but they will pronounce or spell out this grammar using words from another language. It's like I'm speaking Gungwe with English words or vice versa. And so what we see here in this example, and this is what the authors of this paper uh, suggested, is that we're using uh, English words, but the underlining grammar will be the grammar of Malayalam. So you have, you know, the example five, one who eat in salt, he will drink water, according to this author, is organized, uh, you know, according to the rules of Malayalam. So this will be a case of relaxification. And this example here is even more interesting in the sense that what we see here is a word internal code mixing, whereby a stem or a root that is taken from English is combined with an affix. And again, recall that we are, remember that we're dealing with aphasic patients here. So these affixes are taken from Malayalam and the words are taken from English and then these patients are creating, basically they are creating new lexical items. You might sort of think, okay, these patients, they can create these new words, so maybe they are just mixing randomly. And actually you look at the data and they are not doing this randomly. Typically the affixes that are combined with the stems have the categorical specifications of the stems that they are combined with. So in 7a, where the patient is producing a new word, which is kara, where kar is the stem, is the stem or root taken from English, and ra is some sort of nominal affix that is being taken from Italian. 7b is a similar 
a combination where gelt is being taken from German and the ing geltin uh, is taken from English. And here again, the, the, the affix that is being selected is an affix that goes with verbs and not nouns. So what we don't have is something like caring in these kind of uh, outputs. So code mixing in this case is really interesting uh, when we look at neuroatypical, so uh, patients uh, showing uh, a pathological code mixing, this is really interesting because what we see here is that all the produced patterns are well-formed. They are well-formed synthetic objects, and these are well-formed synthetic objects that we find in situations of contacts, mixed languages, creoles, ethnolates, and stuff like that. And here I'm just giving you an example quickly, uh, which shows the same process um, you know, used in Media Lingua, a language discovered by Peter Moiskin um, in the early 80s, where we see that the grammatical items are coming from Quechua and the lexical items are coming from Spanish, and that gives you Media Lingua in the middle. So here. Another thing that I would like to say is that code mixing is not just, you know, an operation that creates well-formed uh, synthetic objects, but it's also not modality dependent. So by looking at spoken languages, you, we could think that, well, this is a property, property of spoken languages. It's actually a property of, let's say, human beings, whether you have access to a spoken language or whether you have access to a sign language or whether you have access to a spoken language and the sign language. And this is the case of bimodals. So these bimodals are children who are born of deaf parents and they are exposed to the spoken language from birth and uh, to the sign language from birth. So they are bimodals in this sense. And what these bimodals do, which we should actually take more seriously in linguistic theory, is that they can produce the two uh, kind of, they can use the two channels simultaneously. So in this example here, which has uh, Italian spoken, and so this is the yellow example, parla con Bianca Neve. So that's Italian and it's been spoken. And the red part under it is uh, Italian sign language. So what you see here in the columns is that the verb parla is spoken while it is being signed at the same time simultaneously. But here it becomes interesting. The con, that is the preposition, is spoken while what is signed is the subject going together with the verb. And then Bianca Neve is spoken. So this is... Uh, a very cool example showing that code mixing, even though because of spoken languages occurs in a sort of linear kind of sequence, need not be. It's a multi-layered process and it is not tied to spoken languages. So it is really uh, a property of the human mind. And what I would like to say here is therefore that uh, the cognitive process responsible for code mixing is extremely resilient. We find it in all speakers, learner, even in speakers, learners who've lost certain properties, certain cognitive properties, uh, namely uh, the capacity to inhibit, um, to inhibit uh, competing languages. I'm struggling with, with uh, the video panel because I can, I can see it, but it, it's, uh, it's sort of going over the slides, but okay, I, I guess that this doesn't bother you too much. So the interim conclusion here is that code mixing is a rule governed uh, process regardless of the neurotype of uh, the learner, the speaker learner, because neurotypical and neuroatypical brains process language according to the same general principles. And co missing becomes apparent only when uh, competing languages are not inhibited. So here at this point, I think an analogy uh, is relevant. And this analogy uh, would be to say that actually the multilingual speaker is like a skilled drummer who can play the parts of the drum individually or simultaneously. And why is this relevant to our uh, discussion? Because there is a difference. Unlike the drummer who has to go through hours of training and rehearsal to be very skilled in, in, in drumming, you know, speakers, learners don't need rehearsal. We just happen to know code mixing instinctively. We do it without instruction. And the question that we need to answer now is where we get this knowledge from? Where does this knowledge come from? 
In order to answer this question, I'll go through a number of hypotheses. So the first hypothesis would be to say that the cognitive process underlying code mixing is actually what drives acquisition. That's why we just happen to have it. It's essential to language acquisition. And code mixing is innate from this perspective. Speaker learners just happen to know it and can do it right even when they lose the cognitive capacity to inhibit competing languages. But if code mixing is innate, then we need a process to map the object that has been created by code mixing onto a specific vocabulary item. And this is where the, the executive functions come in. In, and in this case, I will be building on work by Abu Talibi and Green, who while analyzing uh, code mixing from patients showing pathological code mixing, they propose that pathological code mixing is not due to language processing or code switching per se, but to a dysfunction in the executive function system. So the control meca the mechanism subserving lexical selection across languages. Sorry. So the executive functions here are necessary to map um, the, the, the object that has been created by code mixing onto a specific um, vocabulary item. And this falls well in um, you know, numbers of studies that have been published recently showing that executive functions are relevant for um, vocabulary item learning. But what are executive functions? Executive functions is a sort of umbrella term which in a sense cover various cognitive processes involving attention control, behavioral inhibition and working memory. And, and, and all of this is important for you know, the deliberate control of goal-oriented actions. And this is where the, the analogy with uh, the drummer comes into play. The drummer has to master you know, what the feet are doing and, and what the hands are doing and they are not doing you know, the same thing. They are doing completely different things each kind of uh, playing a different rhythm or a different tune. And as I said, the several studies have shown that these kind of cognitive capacities are involved in language acquisition, especially in, in the acquisition of vocabulary items. So my third hypothesis would then be to say that the knowledge of code mixing precedes the vocabulary selection. So code mixing happens and it's only after that that vocabulary selection happens. So the executive functions are necessary for the selection of, you know, and learning of a specific lexicon, and they have to intervene late during the derivation, that is after code mixing. And this leads me to a tentative model of grammar in which we have the linguistic features and for the sake of the discussion and for being sort of uh, quick, I'm just assuming that these linguistic features, at least the range of these linguistic features are determined somehow by UG. And these features have to be recombined to form a new object. And this is what we see in terms of code mixing, I'll define recombination in the following slides. And it's only after these synthetic objects have been created that they will be mapped onto a specific lexicon. And then the derivation could continue and be shifted to the phonological form or the logical form. So the next question, if we take this perspective, the next question to ask and to answer then would be, well, how does this sort of fit into, you know, what we know as being the monolingual, right? Because you could say, okay, code switching, we're talking about mono, uh, multilinguals, but we still don't know how this will play out if we really consider and if we believe in this notion that, you know, speaker learners can be monolingual. And in order to sort of tackle this question, I would sort of pledge for, uh, the necessity of linguistic theory to embrace what I call a multi-language approach to the null hypothesis. And, you know, this null hypothesis will be that human mind is multilingual. And my working hypothesis here is that what we call code mixing, and we are so happy to investigate this only in the context of multilinguals, is actually a surface manifestation of a cognitive process which I would like to define as recombination. And recombination is what allows all learners, monolinguals or multilinguals alike, to merge distinct linguistic features selected from the inputs into new variants. Recombination therefore is an automated cognitive capacity that probes over relevant linguistic features and merges them into new bundles forming new linguistic objects. 
And this will be seen as an instance of general merge, if I'm using a term from Chomsky, merge in terms of minimalism, merge applies to syntactic objects only. But in, in, in the framework that I'm developing here, merge will apply to all linguistic features, whether they are phonological features, morphological features, syntactic features, or semantic features. So in this perspective, monoglots or assumed monoglots and polyglots all exhibit recombination, but they differ with regard to how the process ap apply to the variants that they are operating on. So in the monolingual kind of mind or the monoglots mind, recombination is restricted to closely related variants. So we are talking here about registers or dialects of the same language. And this is actually what Sally Coco Mufone refers to as, you know, the family resemblance. And that gives us the impression that everybody is doing more or less the same thing, even though looking at what people are doing closely immediately tells us that they are not doing exactly the same thing. And recombination in the polyglot's mind operates on distant varieties or different uh, variants. And these are different simply because they have been sort of selected from genetically or typologically different languages. And recombination, we should recall, is independent of lexical selection. And here, the examples that we, uh, we saw before on uh, word internal mixing by pathological, uh, by patients showing pathological mixing, uh, should be enough to illustrate this point. So now you may ask me, why do we need this descriptive tool? Or at least why do we need to sort of shovel our uh, framework around and, and, and sort of embrace this multi-language approach that I'm talking about and that I'm pushing here? But I think, you know, we need it because we first need to acknowledge the fact that our cur current formal and experimental models which are based on this growth kind of uh, idea where we have an initial state and a final state and the initial state and the final state will lead you know, speaker learners to become monolingual. These models are actually not really good at handling variation and we all know this. They're not going good at handling variation within and across speakers. And they're also not good at handling the language capacity of the multilingual mind all the multilingual speaker learners, which is very dynamic and in constant flux. And here, just think in terms of immigration and think in terms of the, the introduction where uh, you, know, you find yourself in a new country and you have to learn uh, the language of that country. You, know, you do your best, right? Some of us you know, succeed, some you know, get somewhere and get stuck, but you do a little bit. It cannot just be the case that we just add this new knowledge on top of our, let's say, monolingual knowledge of our language. And this knowledge wouldn't affect anything in our mental grammars. And we know this is not true. And it is also important to realize the puzzling tradition that we have within the field, whereby we have studies on language acquisition, first language acquisition. And these are supposed to tell us something about the real thing, uh, you know, acquisition of monolinguals. And this, this is what we want to understand. Then on the side, we have studies on second language acquisition. This tells us something about bilingual is basically when you have more than one, what happens? And then we have studies on language contact and this, they tell us about everything that happens in contact situation. Then you get Creoles, you get ethnolects, you get, you know, what else? So the issues of language contact from this perspective are assumed to be exceptional. But this is very misleading, I think. It is misleading because there is no such a thing as language contact without individuals. Languages don't walk around the street and meet each other, right? Only individuals meet. And indiv individuals belong to networks, which can be very fluid and varying. And when individuals meet, they engage in you know, linguistic behavior to which their brains are sensitive. And their brains actually pick out of this linguistic behavior certain patterns, which will then develop into uh, mental grammars. So what speakers are exposed to is highly heterogeneous and it's the, the, the total amount of these linguistic features that our brains are uh, exposed to which will trigger language acquisition. So the idiolect that we end up speaking is a recombined version of the total idiolect that populated the input. And of course we cannot reproduce this total idiolects faithfully. So what we recombine is a subset of everything that we've been exposed to. 
Another example here to, to make this clear is this slide where you see that, you know, in our urban zones uh, where we, we have our children going to school, it's typically the case that children are exposed to the community standard, which is taught in school. Then they're exposed to colloquial varieties. So these are the ones that are spoken with peer uh, students or, uh, you know, within the community. And they're also exposed to minority languages of different types and the L2 variant. So suppose you move to a country, you don't speak the language of the, you don't speak the language of the host country very well, but your kids are going to school in this country. And so they, they get to speak that language uh, natively, but you actually speak it as an L2. So what we see here is that what the child will develop as a language, which is coming from what Salikoko Mufwene calls the pool of linguistic features triggering learning, will be a subset of all the context that the child was exposed to. So all the linguistic context, let me put it this way, that the child was exposed to. And this is what I refer to as a hybrid grammar, because what the child develops comes from diverse sources, and it is a subset of that diverse sources. So learning here, the implication would be that learning feeds on heterogeneous input that is in a state of flux, and the output of recombination are hybrid mental grammars. And this is something that I've done in my previous work, you know, a 2015 book, a paper that just came out and a work with uh, Michel de Graaf. What we need to keep in mind here is that communities are heterogeneous in terms of their linguistic practices. And not all members of a community develop exactly the same competence in all registers, dialects used in that community. Hence the notion of formal multilingualism that I'm sort of arguing for here as being the default. And here I'm just giving you an example. I'll, I'll run through this uh, very quickly, showing uh, you know, the type of input that certain children might be exposed to. And this is something that I experienced firsthand during a travel uh, from Amsterdam uh, to a conference. And then you know, a child and his mom boarded the plane, sat behind me, the child was about four years old. And he said, you know, only in Dutch, mommy, mommy, it had dosed. And then the mother re sort of replied, Lali, rest tranquil, je pas drink ici. So what you, what you see here is that the, the context is a Dutch context, but the reaction of the mother is actually in French, but not just any French. The first stretch, rest tranquil, sounds like standard French, but then you get je pas drink ici. So we already have an insertion of an English word into a French sequence. And then she continues, ils vont donner drink là après. And then we get something that is really interesting uh, for those of us who are interested in uh, um, varieties of French, we get a post-nominal determiner. And this is not found to be found in standard English, uh, standard French, sorry, even though you find it in Francais Québécois and West African varieties of French. So here, what we see here is that we have drink being followed by a determiner. So we have two things which are quite interesting here. The first drink is being inserted in a French sequence without a determiner. French is known for not liking bare nouns. French actually strongly disallows bare nouns. And then the second thing that we have is that we don't have a you know, typical standard French determiner. We actually have this, you know, let's say colloquial variety of these determiners, which is actually more like a topic marker. Uh, and it occurs in post-nominal position. And then she continues and she say wacht. Right? And then she continues and she said, pardon. So the, the output, the utterance of the matter is very mixed. What, what I found amazing was the fact that during this whole conversation uh, and very stretches of, of dialogues, the child kept speaking in Dutch. And at some point, the mother, I think she was a little bit tired and she said, blab still, that is, you know, rest tranquil again, you know, stay calm. And then she continued in some African language which I think is some Afro-Asiatic language, but I couldn't identify it correctly. So basically we cannot assume this child to reproduce all his mother's varieties, but we cannot also not basically assume that these mother varieties don't play any role in his native Dutch because he will end up speaking Dutch natively. And he will produce patterns that are superficially similar to other patterns produced by other Dutch speakers. But what is important from my analysis here is that these superficial patterns do not derive from the same learning hypothesis, simply because the, the inputs that learners are exposed to are different. So what we need to keep in mind here is that learners are exposed to set of linguistic features 
but they don't select all the linguistic features that they are exposed to, which means that in a competition, not all linguistic features will be equally uh, successful. So an ecologically valid linguistic model that accounts for the human language capacity um, and acquisition and change must assume contact here as an essential part of speaker learners linguistic experience. Without contact, no acquisition, whether first or second. So how does recombination operate on linguistic features? I've been talking about recombination and it would be nice to illustrate how it operates on linguistic features. Well, in order to illustrate how the recombination operates, I'll be assuming a rather standard uh, kind of uh, hypothesis that lexical or grammatical items have three aspects to them, uh, phonology, morphosyntax, and semantics. And phonology will be the rules of pronunciation. And you can already know from my pronunciation that I'm doing something wrong to English. The morphosyntax will be the rules of uh, regulating the distribution in sentences and the semantics will be the rules of interpretation. What is important to keep in mind is that during acquisition, any of these boxes can be affected individually. And that actually gives you potentially eight competitors for, you know, acquiring a lexical item. So I'm representing this here with this figure where the target is the box in the middle with three zeros in blue. And beside that box, anything that has a, a red dot or a red one in it is a distant variety. What you see therefore is that some varieties or some variants, oh, sorry, are closer to the target than some others. So anything that has only one modification in one box would be close to the target. And anything that has more than one modification in let's say two different boxes will be uh, more distant to the target. So we have two sets of let's say acceptability judgment uh, within the pool. Those which are close and th these are the ones that people say, yeah, I won't say it, but I hear some people say it. And those that are a little bit further away, which people will say, yeah, no, this one is ungrammatical or unacceptable. Okay, what is crucial for our discussion is that even though we have this acceptability judgment over this sort of recombined uh, uh, items, they are all viable items and they can propagate within the population under you know, good, circum favorable circumstances. And in order to convince you of this, I will, I will use two examples. This first one coming from work by Jim Wood, uh, a colleague from uh, Yale University, where he showed that a certain colloquial um, American English speakers, learners use rather as a verb. So this will be like 12B. I will tell him that I would have rather slept in a bed and so on and so on. Or 12C, but all in all, a strip clause is where I would have rathered him gone. So this will be a variant of rather where the adverbial rather is recombined with a verbal feature, which allows it to be used as a verb. The second example comes from my own Beninois French, uh, where I will show you that I can use three different types of manger in French in my Beninois French. The first manger being in yellow, the second one in brown, and the third one is uh, in red. So what does the sentence say? The sentence say, La boîte nous a offert un super banquet, nous avons bien mangé, sauf que le lendemain, nous avons appris que les dirigeants avaient mangé tout l'argent de l'entreprise. Nous avons mangé la honte. The company offered us a nice banquet. We ate, so that's the first one in yellow, very well. But the following day, we learned that the CEOs misappropriated the money. So the, the brown one actually eats money will mean to misappropriate money. And then, we were ashamed. So the third one, it a shame, actually means to be ashamed. And then you may wonder where we got this kind of recombination from. And you can only understand where this recombination come from if you look at the Bay and Kwa languages. And these languages have the so-called inherent complement verbs. And these are verbs which in their citation forms come with nominal complements. So, so in Gungwe, to eat is actually not a simple verb. It's a complex verb, including this do, and nu, it's actually do, nu, do something to thing, and that says to eat. That's the yellow one. But you can see that you, you can replace the, the nominal complement by a set of other complements to have different meanings, including to spend, which is the brown one, which is do quer. It is literally eat money, and that, that means to spend money. 
And to be a shame is actually du winyan, which is to be a shame. So the relax, so the the patterns that we uh, saw here uh, is a pattern that is built on French being recombined with, let's say, flavors of gungwe. So what we have here in this kind of uh, characterization of this idea like this manger, which can be used as French, so the yellow uh, kind of uh, uh, properties uh, where it means to consume food, or it can be used as in gungwe, where it basically means some sort of light verb that you combine with some complements to get to different meanings, including to spend, uh, misappropriate, and be ashamed. The interim conclusion here, therefore, is that uh, due to recombination, every speaker learner uh, will introduce new variants in the system. And such variants are hybrid constructs, just as I've shown. And these variants are in competition with other variants being introduced by other members of the community. The implication of this view are many for our theory, uh, or, you know, our studies of, of language, but I would like to mention two, which I think are very important here, one being grammaticalization and the second one being, you know, the kind of constraints that we find on closal uh, structure, because the recombination view that I developed here suggests that the process is free. And if that's the case, we should sort of see more uh, language types than we see in the actual world. And the question is why it is the case. So with regard to uh, grammaticalization, I don't want to now start a new lecture on grammaticalization. There's been uh, a couple of talks on grammaticalization on Abraline, but the one that I, I think would, is relevant to what I will be saying here is the talk by Brian Josephs on Abraline, which I'm referring you to. And in sort of to understand my point, I will basically uh, take you know, the common uh, definition of grammaticalization as being a unidirectional process through which uh, a content word will develop into a grammatical function or meaning. But of course, this is debatable and the references that you have here point to people who do not necessarily agree with this versus people who agree with this view. Under universal multilingualism, which actually has contact at the heart of acquisition and the heart of language change, grammaticalization cannot be seen as a linguistic phenomenon proper. It's actually a window into the population history. So when we study grammaticalization, we're not really studying linguistic issues, we're studying population history. And to sort of convince you of what I'm saying here, I would like to take you through a hypothetical scenario um, you know, in Dutch. So Dutch has the verb blijven, uh, which you can use in present tense, and you can say something like it blijft thuis, and it means I will stay home, I'm staying home, and I stay home. But you can also use this blive uh, to encode progressive. So 13b, ik blijf betalen, that doesn't mean I stay pay, it actually means I'm paying or I pay usually. Now, this strategy of encoding, let's say progressive, habitual, is in competition with other strategies, strategies that you find in Dutch, one being uh, the one under 14, which combines uh, the copula B plus a determiner plus an infinitive. And it's so, this is the so-called unhet construction. And you know you can say something like ik ben unhet betalen, which is literally I am at the paying. And it means I'm paying. And this uh, strategy again is in competition with, you know, uh, some other strategies, including the following one on the 15, where you can use a number of verbs. And this is interesting, right? We're talking about verbs of posture here. And these verbs like zitten, sit, stand, stand, liegen, lie, and lopen, walk, you combine them with the uh, infinitival marker te plus an infinitive, and then you get to the progressive. And this is what you get on the 15, exit the betalen. So the conclusion here, the interim conclusion is that in, you know, in Dutch, progressive can be encoded in various ways, including the bliven plus infinitive, uh, the sein an het plus infinitive, the zitten stan liegen lopen plus te plus infinitive. Now suppose there is an influx of new Dutch learners and these new Dutch learners have in their linguistic bagage uh, structures such as 17, 16a um, and 16b. And these are taken from Gungwe, my uh, father's tongue. In Gungwe, you can say, I stay home. And that basically means I stay home or I stay at home. 
But Goomba only has one way to encode arbitrary aspect, which is to use the same no, so the verb. So in Goomba, you have to say no suque 16b to mean I usually pay. That's the only way you can encode arbitrary aspect in Goomba. So it might well be the case that these speakers while learning Dutch will introduce these new patterns in Dutch and they might be actually reinforcing the usage of uh, progressive stay uh, in the population. And if this reinforcement goes you know, over several generations, it might well be the case that at the end of the process, all the other competitors, so the unhead and the other Zitten and, uh, and, and co uh, competitors will be wiped out. Or they will be limited to a very narrow pocket of the population. So what we will see here will basically be an historical development of new learners, learners of a different profile. Here I'm using Goombe speakers, but this could also be you know, speakers of Dutch who basically had a different analysis of uh, the patterns that is being considered here. So basically the point is to say that what we see at the end of the grammaticalization process is basically the result of a competition between different variants. And that already suggests that the process cannot be unidirectional as we tend to say. But it also makes a, a nice uh, prediction that has already been shown to be true in the literature because it basically says that if you look at the size of the population, you look at the structure of the population, basically you look at the networks within which uh, speaker learners are navigating, you might say something insightful about the kind of change that may happen, but also about the type of change that may happen and the speed in which this change may happen. Of course, these are external factors. And if external factors can affect a change, we cannot say that the change itself is a linguistic uh, process. So recombination in this case is what allows competition and what we get is a competition between different variants and populations will move one way or the other, depending on external factors. This is what Chomsky called the third factor, basically. So the next point I would like to touch upon uh, maybe quickly uh, is the fact that uh, even though recombination as I presented here seems to be a free process, uh, it doesn't lead to very wild structural changes. And the question is why is the case? Well, here uh, I will sort of present you with some facts and then some suggestions and speculations. The facts are the following, very quickly. When we look at the closed structures as being, uh, let's say, an extension of the verbal domain where arguments are introduced, plus an inflectional layer where you encode tense, mood, and aspect, plus a left periphery where you encode uh, discourse properties such as information structure, we realize that the, the verbal domain is pretty stable cross-linguistically. Basically, the way arguments are introduced by different, you know, different verb classes and the way these arguments are mapped onto, uh, um, let's say, thematic roles correlates with some precedent relations, which is uh, known in the literature as thematic hierarchy. And there's you know, many uh, versions of thematic hierarchy, but in, in this talk, I'll just take uh, 17a, which I'm taking from a work by uh, Rapaport and Levine, to be like a gross representation of what uh, thematic hierarchies are. And what that suggests is that our human mind is somehow biased towards something like 18a, where you have agents preceding theme, patients preceding goal, source, location, against something like 18b, where you have, let's say, goal, source, location being on top preceding agent and, and, and theme. So that seems to be a constant that has been found both by typologists, generativists, and uh, so linguists of uh, different persuasions. The second fact is about the inflectional domain, which encodes tense, mood, and aspect specifications. And what we see cross-linguistically, and this has been noticed since the early 80s, is that we systematically see the same scope hierarchies. And this hierarchy is very rigid in the sense that uh, using work by Case Hengerfels here, a colleague of mine, uh, when you look at expressions of aspect, tense, evidentiality, elocution, and so on, and you look at what occurs to the right of a stem, then you see that uh, aspect markers will be closer to the stem than tense markers, which will be closer to the stem than uh, evidentiality, and so on and so on. But what is remarkable here is that when these 
expressions occur to the left of the stem, they occur in the mirror image or some subset of, let's say, possible mirror images of what you get on the right. And this is actually what Mark Baker referred to as the mirror principle, which Chingwe used systematically in his seminal work in 1999, showing that human languages are forced, in a sense, to, you know, to take this functional hierarchy, which I'm illustrating here, where the scope relations between modality tense, modality aspect is just the same across languages. So this is also very stable. And it suggests that regardless of, of the flowery kind of morphology that morphology that you can have for your TMA expressions, the underlying scope relations are just the same. So it seems the closed structure doesn't care about your morphology in this sense. And interestingly, for those of uh, us who are interested also in the, the debate on Creole languages, it's really interesting to see that Creole languages follow the same rule. And you know those who argue that Creoles emerged from pigeons should be telling us why this is the case. Right? Creoles actually didn't produce anything spectacular here. They just produce whatever we find in other languages, which is why I think Peter Moiskin was very right when he said that when we look at Creole languages, all we see are languages. So the point here then would be that the language instinct is biased toward a specific TMA sequencing. And I will claim that this knowledge is innate. And that's where the typological uniformity that we find comes from. And I would suggest that the inflow domain, so the TMA domain is immune to change, right? And so in what follows, I would suggest that, you know, the structural change that we're interested in that allows us to say, okay, languages are SVO, SOV, VSO, are actually structural changes which are somehow determined or triggered by changes within the left periphery which is specialized in licensing discourse related properties. That's basically the idea that I would like to uh, push here. And you know, for your own kind of exercise, you can just try to figure out what really makes uh, uh, you know, uh, Germanic languages distinct from Romance. I bet the only thing you will find is the V2 property, right? In the TMA zone, they behave pretty similarly. And you can do the same thing for various kinds of languages. So it seems that when we move to the left periphery, so the traditional CP domain, that's where we start finding, finding very interesting kind of uh, changes. So the claim will then be to say that language vary structurally only within uh, you know, their left uh, periphery. And this is because the left periphery, which I'm assuming to be not just the CP domain in the closer domain, but also the D domain in the non-phrase, non are the ones which are involved in licensing information structural properties. So now I'm pushing the idea that if you really want to see how languages differ, think about their information structure. Things that syntacticians like to push into pragmatics, but I'm telling you now, th these things are really part of syntax following work by uh, Luigi Rizzi. So the second claim will therefore be to say that the left periphery being an interface, this is the interface which sort of linked to the proposition to the discourse, um, it's in a sense uh, a point where you put together different components of grammar. And maybe this is why uh, this point uh, could actually give rise to more ambiguities than the rigid scope relations that we find within the inflow domain. And this could be the reason why we find more changes here. Basically, learners will be allowed somehow to generate more possible alternatives within the left periphery than they will be able to do within uh, the TMA zone. So if you put these two claims together, then we get to the conclusion that, or at least the, the assumption that the left periphery might be vulnerable because it is a point of ambiguity, uh, it might be vulnerable during acquisition. And this has already been shown by tons of work, including by some of my colleagues on acquisition where it's been shown that Acquisition of the left periphery is vulnerable for multilinguals in general, so bilinguals uh, in general, and it's even more so for late learners. And this is something that I think we have to think about. Why would that be the case? So advanced learners seem to still have problems with the left periphery, so issues of information structure, even though they can master you know, the inflectional domain uh, very well. So the internal conclusion here is that structural changes only happen at the top of the close, that is 
uh, you know, the uh, CP layer, which I'm now referring to as the left periphery. So the next question that we want to ask uh, and which I would like to speculate about is why does the left periphery represent a point of typological variation at all? So why is it the case that this is the point that changes? I don't have any brand new study to sort of use here to sort of back up my claims, um, but you know, I would just like to share some thoughts with you. And these are some, some speculations based on uh, work that has been already done in the literature. So the left periphery, the CP domain or the DP domain seems to have three fundamental properties in the sense that it is a point of spell out. So that's where you sort of send everything to spell out. It is a point of labeling according to Luigi Rizzi's work. This is the point where you decide that, okay, what I've built now is a non phrase or it, it is a close or it is a nominalized close. And it is also a point of interface between different kind of modules, namely syntax, semantics, and pragmatics. And the idea would be to say that this could explain why the left peripheral properties of information structure represent uh, an area of difficulties for late learners. So speakers, learners, arguably postulate more competing alternatives for this layer. And the second point I would like to uh, speculate on is you know, processing and, and how that relates to brain structure. One thing that we have in our field is that you know, the, the structure that I presented previously, sorry for you know, flashing behind. So this one is typically assumed to be processed the same from you know, top down or bottom up, depending on your persuasion. And arguably in the same uh, kind of neural network, in a sort of localized neural network. But actually the, we don't have any strong principle reason to believe in this. It could well be the case that the, the components of the closed structure are not uh, processed uh, similarly. So the asymmetry that I just talked about, whereby the inflectional domain and the predicate domain are stable versus the left periphery, will actually be compatible with an idea whereby uh, the, the inflectional domain and the predicate phrase are processed differently from the left periphery. And this will be maybe a good reason why we again find more restructuring or reanalysis within the left periphery uh, than within the inflectional domain and the uh, predicate phrase. As far as I know, this kind of distinction that I just made here has not been taken into account in processing studies, uh, which I think rather take the a linear kind of approach. So here are my final words. I hope I've convinced you that, you know, in order really to understand what makes us unique and fascinating, which is this capacity of just navigating between, you know, systems which are supposed to be different, but we do it so easily. Uh, we need to take this multi-language approach that I'm, I'm, I'm talking about. And this will actually, in a sense, allow us to develop an ecologically valid theory of the speaker learner's knowledge of language. It will allow us to engage into a more dynamic view of acquisition rather than a static one and help us understand changes, how changes build on contact and ideologies. It will allow us to go to, to have a view of grammar that is a hybrid construct based on varying subsystems that are in competition within the community. And of course, it will allow us to understand why certain parts of the closed structure are more stable uh, than other parts of the closed structure. And in this case, the idea will be that variation is not across the board, variation, structural variation seems to come from, you know, a unique kind of location, the left periphery, which for those of us who uh, master, um, you know, the language of minimalism uh, will actually uh, consist a phase. And I will suggest that structural changes are a phase level property. A variation therefore will result from how speaker learners recombine mental, uh, features that they are exposed to and how these recombined features sort of emerge in their mental grammars. A few uh, other points would be to keep in mind, always keep in mind in our studies that learners are not clones of each other and that they don't have, you know, holistic or wholesale grammars. What they have are subsystems, which we can refer to as a rainbow of grammars. And they put these subsystems into combination 
uh, in specific uh, communicative settings, communicative settings. Language change will then result from population change. So language change at the population level, when we say English changed, we are actually talking about a difference in population. Or when we say Gungwe changed from, let's say, Aladagbe into Gungwe, we're talking about a population change. And the last point, but not least, is this point which I would like to stress again, which is that the human mind is essentially multilingual. And the brain is presumably pre-wired to handle ever varying change in linguistic inputs. And our societies should actually nurture, not just promote multilingualism. We should nurture multilingualism and keep in mind that forcing our citizens, and this is for my, you know, uh, uh, some of the people out there listening from, from Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, especially countries like Benin, Togo, and so on. Uh, I think it is important for us to, to realize that forcing our children into uh, monolingualism and abandoning their mother tongues is a way of crippling them, basically handicapping them. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Abo. Uh, let, let me see if I'm online. It's still on you. Well, um, there were, uh, this transmission on Zoom was uh, parallelly uh, broadcast on YouTube. So there were questions on, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I lost a bit of what you just said. So there were transmission problems, you said? No, no. Uh, uh, I am not uh, visible, I guess. But anyway. No, um, I, I can ah, see. Now, now yeah. I can see. Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> this transmission was also on YouTube, and there people made questions. Okay. But, uh, uh, and I've uh, written down some six questions. And I would like to read them to you. But first, uh, I would like to say some words about uh, how important it is for us linguists to study deviant material. Uh, if we only study what is normal, we don't learn so much about normality. We learn more from, uh, for example, aphasia. Or uh, there was another lecture I saw on Abralinha of Vivu where someone said, I don't remember who it was, slips of the tongue are a, a proof that words are not as crystal blocks. They are not ready in our mind. That's why we make mistakes when, when we speak because there is a combination every time we speak. Mm -hmm. From child language, we can also have very uh, precious examples of how language works when the child makes something we call mistakes. And uh, from aphasia, we learn about the mental lexicon. And yeah. one of the first questions was about pathologic, because your talk started yeah. there, uh, about pathological uh, code mixing. Uh, if uh, not aphasic ha do code switching code mixing and the result is a well-formed unit how is it in aphasia are these new forms these recombinations well-formed or are they random okay yeah so so that's a a, a a very interesting question and as i said in 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 the talk uh from what i've seen in the literature Okay, some of the patterns that are produced by these patients that are looked at in the literature, if you look at them from the linguistic perspective, they are well formed in the sense that they just look like what we find in, um, let's say, neurotypical situations where people engage in creative linguistic usage in creating new words. So the examples that I showed there are no different from the examples that we saw, for example, in media lingua, which is a language spoken by a whole community. So they are well-formed objects. And that is uh, one of the, the, the properties of our mind when it comes to language. And it is something that I, I stress a lot uh, in, 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 you know, in my lectures. It seems that the human mind 
does not make, let's say, non-converging uh, outputs. So let me put it this way. The human neurotypical mind does not produce non-converging outputs. The outputs are always converging. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Uh, and, and the same person, it was but, but, Ahmed. I mean, this Al is interesting, right? Sorry, because before we move, this is interesting, right? Because basically what it says is that we don't know, our mind doesn't know what ungrammatical is. It's, it's not, I mean, it didn't develop to do that, right? So what we call unacceptable or ungrammatical are conventions, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, so, yes. that, so, so mm -hmm. our mind evolved to only produce things that are linguistically valid. Yes, and in aphasia, we would say an aphasic speaker is a speaker. Yeah, exactly. So, but here we also have to be careful, right? Because I'm using a specific set of aphasic patients, but you know, this is a continuum, right? And it may well be the case that if we investigate some other patients, these might have actually lost the cognitive capacity of recombination. And these will therefore show uh, certain non-converging outputs. As I said in the talk, uh, this perspective has a lot of implications for linguistic uh, theory, but it also has a lot of implications for, let's say, clinical uh, uh, aspects, right? Because what it means that is that a patient that is doing pathological code mixing still has access to recombination, producing mm -hmm. only converging outputs. A patient that is producing something that we don't find in languages will then be a different type of patient producing something that is non-converging. And we mm -hmm. shouldn't treat them the same, mm -hmm. clinically speaking, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the same person, Ahmed Altaif, who asked the first question, also asked if uh, pathological code switching in aphasia is curable, and I would say, Aphasia is not a disease, but a yeah, exactly. consequence of a stroke. Exactly. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So you, you get the answer. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a disease. That's <laughs> why I use, you know, and I was I also tend to make this mistake. And it is good to sort of stress this. Pathological code mixing is not a disease, is a is the kind of behavior, right? So yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question from Lorenzo Salvioni. Uh, why is the second language taught in Benin, Spanish or German, and not Hausa, for example? Is it because Benin's education system mirrors the French education system? Yeah, that's that's the easiest and uh, and 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 fast answer. It it is this, but I think it goes beyond that. I think it's all be you know belongs to this uh, kind of colonial uh, mindset that that our countries and some of you know our citizens actually have, which is basically, you know, our languages don't, you know, they are not useful. So if you want to be useful in life, what you need to do is learn French. And okay, once you've mastered French, what is the other language there? Okay, maybe English uh, and Spanish or German, then you can talk to the outsiders, which is a very weird way of looking at things because we are taught not to talk to our neighbors in a sense, <laughs> you know, you want to talk to the French guy, you will, you know, mostly, you know, for most Beninois, they will never meet a, a native French speaker, right? So, so this, this really comes from this weird uh, idea that, uh, you know, uh, Sub-Saharan African countries have that, you know, in order to succeed, you have to learn, you know, a foreign language. Uh, and, and this puts many pupils in, in danger, simply because uh, many of the pupils actually have to learn a language that no one speaks around them. <laughs> yeah. You know this, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, Antonio Lafuria asks, what is the difference between interlanguage and code switching for bilinguals and multilingual people? Well, for, uh, as far as I'm concerned, and from the theoretical perspective, there is no difference. So what I'm, I've been trying to do in, in my talk is to show that many of these differences that we put on these, let's say behaviors, are you know, differences that linguists need to classify this behavioral kind of, uh, mm -hmm. let's say, um, uh, 
yeah, you know, these kind of behaviors that we find in our communities. But what I'm trying to say is that underlyingly, uh, the speaker learners are not producing anything different. I mean, the processes that generate these outputs is always the same, regardless of whether a linguist wants to call it interlanguage or code mixing or whatever, the process is the same. So formally speaking, there is no principal difference between these things. And, and I think uh, Tom Rupert made a similar distinction between what we call bilinguals in terms of you know, social recognition of the bilinguals and what we want to call, you know, what I'm calling the multilinguals, formally speaking. Uh, so the multilingual for me is someone, even though that person might not speak two different languages socially recognized, the fact that this person can have access to different registers makes this person a multilingual from the formal perspective. Because what mm -hmm. I'm pushing is that the capacity to move from one register to the other is the same involved mm -hmm. in moving from English into French. Which again, going back to African countries, which basically strengthen my position that we have to start with our mother tongue first. If you master that, you can do the other ones, right? <laughs> because you, you strengthen that capacity. Yeah. To switch from one variety to the yeah. other, from the standard yeah. to... Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Um, Austin Howard asks, I wonder what is the effect of code switching on the perception of nativeness within communities and on ethnic differentiation? Well, but that depends on communities, right? There are some communities where um, People are, you know, do not engage in uh, code switching, uh, switching because the languages that they speak in those communities are reserved for a specific, let's say, context. So there might be a language that you only speak when you're talking to elderly people, and you don't switch into uh, the variety that you speak when you're talking to uh, people of your own age, right? So there are some communities where things are really compartmentalized, uh, and there is no code switching. And there's also, so, so in those communities, code switching could be kind of perceived negatively, right? And I actually think, you know, uh, you know if you take um, the Francophone uh, zone, for example, and you take a country like Benin, and I think, you know, a couple of years back, if you, you know, take uh, uh, Quebec, code switching was not uh, kind of positively uh, sort of viewed, mm -hmm. right? So because, you know, you have to speak mm -hmm. only French and then so on. Uh, but there are some other countries where, you know, moving from one language to the other is actually even considered, you know, what you want to do uh, to show your competence in these languages. Uh, so in those mm -hmm. countries like Benin, in some contexts, code switching is actually positively evaluated. So it really depends on the communities and the context. Mm -hmm. Uh, Emeka, with a long last name, asks, what are the implications of recombination on pigeons and creole? Well, the, the, the fast answer is that uh, recombination shows that there is no such a thing as pigeon or a creole. There are only languages. And then again, linguists mm -hmm. will go around and label these languages the way they want. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Arodo Andrade asks, is there evidence for direct influence in terms of marked information structure construction, or is it at a deeper level? Uh, I'm not sure I get that question. If there is a difference between marked construction? Is there evidence for direct influence in terms of marked information structure constructions, or is it at a deeper level? I guess he was referring to the last part. The, the, the last part. Well, uh, this, as I said in that last part, this is where I only have speculations, right? And I think that there is um, more study needed. But one thing that I can tell from my own studies is that if you look at languages like uh, Singapore English, for example, or you look at uh, some Creoles that I've worked on, or even if you look at the you know, Beninois French that I mentioned, elements that are introduced in this new var variety or these new variants are typically elements that relate to the information structure. Remember, I mentioned this post-nominal law, and I said this post-nominal law encodes topic, right? So in Singapore English, 
what you find is that you find these English stretches. And at the end of the sentence, you find a cluster of particles, discourse particles. And again, these discourse particles are taken from Cantonese and or some other uh, uh, languages that speakers know. And they, they have meanings. They are not just noise. I mean, they really have meanings, mm -hmm. right? So, so these will be cases where, <laughs> so these will be cases where you really see the integration of uh, properties of information structure coming from one language being added to another language, which is English. And this makes sense because English only encodes information structure with intonation, right? Mm -hmm. So if you speak another language than English and you have access to these particles, what you want to do is not bother yourself with intonation to, to encode topicality. What you want to do is actually use these discourse markers. And, and Singapore English mm -hmm. is very uh, good for, for, for that. I mean, it's a good example to illustrate this. So I think it, it is actually out there. We just need to study this more. Yes, yes. Um, there's one last, everybody is, uh, who had their questions answered is thanking very much for the excellent question. Um, and there are two more questions. Yeah. Uh, Marcia Machado Vieira asks, Talking, taking into consideration that we deal with social issues, can we also think about con, uh, the, the living together of variants? Uh, I mean, yeah. I don't know if this is an English word, instead of competition. So oh, that yeah, we think yeah. in a dynamic view in yeah. multilingual society. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's, that's a very interesting question. And it allows me to, to sort of explain what I'm saying. Competition doesn't necessarily mean exclusion. It actually means mm -hmm. that living together, <laughs> right? But they are in competition because they, they fulfill different functions. And because they fulfill different functions and because new speakers are coming and coming, it may well be that uh, elements which started out as fulfilling you know, different uh, functions will then be used to fulfill the same function. When this happens, then one of them wins out, all right? But I'm not saying that the other one disappears completely. The mm -hmm. other one takes another route, right? And then it will be, you know, within certain circles of the community, uh, people will use it in certain contexts and so on and so on. So basically what we have is living together, but the competition has to do with the specialization, right? So the items will be specialized for different functions. Mm -hmm. So competition in this case really means living together, yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess the last question here is, uh, does your theory, well, your theory is, uh, predict faster change for languages with few speakers where change can be implemented more easily or for larger languages with potentially larger feature pools? That's, that's a really interesting. That's again interesting because what, what my theory predicts is basically that before you answer that question, you have to look at the structure of the population. And the size alone doesn't tell you this. The size is important, but you also have to remember I said that languages don't meet, right? Languages are individuals. Mm -hmm. so, so what is happening within the, the community is also very important. So if you have in that community, for example, a very stratified kind of community with one member on top, and if that person, that queen doesn't say, yes, we want to go this way, no, no one else goes, then change will be very slow, right? Mm -hmm. But if you have a community where there is no normative pressure and people are very free uh, to adopt a new variant, then change could be very fast. So this is why I think that the kind of theory I'm, I'm pushing really calls upon linguists to work together. Because as a synthetician, I cannot get this knowledge, but I know sociolinguists do. Sociolinguists who work on variation, they, they have this knowledge and they can make these pre, uh, you know, predictions. And with computer stimulation, simulations, we can actually understand these things better. So, mm -hmm. so we need to, take into account the size, but we also need to take into account the structure. Yeah, this 
this was the last question. Thank you very much. And Thank you. Do you want to say some final words? Well, the final word would be to thank again uh, Abralin for giving me the, the honor, you know, of sharing my views with the world. I mean, this is this is fantastic. But but especially for giving us, you know, this opportunity during this very difficult time to share our knowledge and, and put it out there and have people sort of react and learn from each other. And I think this is very important. And it's so important that this is coming from the global south, right? It's not, and this is, also, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, this is really important. It shows that, you know, they, they, they can be changed and, and it doesn't always need to come from the same side. So this for me is a mm -hmm. very nice example of exchange of knowledge for the world. So thank you for allowing me to be part of this. Thanks. Thanks for Abralin. Thank you, Enoch Abo, and this was it. Yeah, thank you. <laughs>